we got a real treat tonight. We got the three musketeers over here. Uh, we, got, we got two that you're going to see right away. And then we got one hiding out in the background. And, but uh, the show doesn't go on unless you have the good report people, you know, backstage. Otherwise, it just doesn't happen. Okay. But the other was the backstage person first. Uh, so today I asked her how do you pronounce your name. She said, well, it's just like cotton. So, uh, Totem. Cotton. <laughs> 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 Backstage and she's major. I did that kind of I did, and I told her I was to have pronounce her name, so I did that. Besides that, you can ask my wife, I practiced it at home. Uh, all right, but anyway, we have Liz, and you all know Liz Messer, which is the director of the library. And we have Tish, and Tish Dickinson. Okay, and I, you're really going to enjoy this tonight. I, I've been looking forward to this uh, ever since when, and so I'll stop talking. And ladies and gentlemen, the program presented to you by the library and by Canastota Canal Town. I now introduce you to Tish. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thank you for coming. My goodness, what a wonderful sized crowd. We're delighted. Uh, I wanted to tell you how this program actually came about. Uh, Liz, Beth, and I belong to a women's study group called the Columbian Club, and it has been in operation since 1898. And the purpose of the club was to help women broaden their horizons, particularly at the turn of the century when not everyone had a chance to uh, study as, uh, as we can now. And so they picked wonderful topics. And they're still picking them. <laughs> so, uh, and we try to be a little more avant-garde than 1898, but we do a wonderful job of thinking about what things we'd like to know more about. And two years ago, the club determined, wouldn't it be interesting to look at history through the eyes of women? Until recently, history was written primarily by men. And though we know a lot about the women who lived through all these centuries, we don't have a lot of writing that was written by women, for women, until more recently, when we really began to find lots and lots of materials that before then had not really been discovered. And so this group determined they were going to go back as far as possible to see which women really represented their era. And so we picked 11. Uh, some were exemplary of the period. Some were interesting because they weren't, because they were so different or unique in their period. Some are very famous. Some you'll know. Some you may never have heard of, and they're equally as interesting. And so tonight we're going to bring you 11 perspectives on the era that these women each lived in. And we did go back quite a ways. The very first one was Eloise. Eloise, the second part of Eloise and Abelard. She was born in 1101. So we have a millennium of women's perspectives. We're very delighted to, to make that scope. Interestingly enough, uh, those letters between Eloise and her beloved Peter Abelard were known for a very long time. And it's interesting to also note that women in the Middle Ages began to have a voice. It seems uh, hard to understand that, except to understand that one of the things that women could do was to become a nun. And if you became a nun of great importance, you might become an abbess. And if you were the head of a monastery, either a, a male or a female, you had considerable power. Eloise was remarkable for the period because she was considered one of the intellects of the period. And she was the ward of an uncle who, seeing her promise, wanted her to study with the greatest intellect of the time, which was Peter Abelard. He was a great philosopher and widely respected. And so he introduced them, and as luck would have it, they fell in love. Uh, passionately, 
deeply in love. Uh, they conceived a child, and Peter and Eloise were married. But it was secret, because his career would have been would have suffered if they had known about this affair. Well, the uncle wasn't so thrilled about what had happened. And in the Middle Ages, vengeance was quite serious. In his sleep, the uncle sent men to do his vengeance, and they were and he had, was castrated. So it was very serious. And he feared for the life of Eloise. She went to a convent. He became a monk. And while they still loved one another, they were never able to be together again. Abelard really became, again, a still, or still, a very fine philosopher and intellect of the time. Eloise never got over the love she had for him. And so their letters are quite poignant. And tonight we're going to hear a little bit about how Eloise and Abelard shared the love that had been denied them. Please welcome Eloise. A letter of yours to a friend happened some days since to fall into my hands. My knowledge of the writing and my love of the hand gave me the curiosity to open it. In justification of the liberty I took, I flattered myself I might claim a sovereign privilege over everything which came from you. Nor was I scrupulous to break through the rules of good breeding when I was to hear news of Abelard. But how dear did my curiosity cost me? What disturbance did it occasion? And how surprised I was to find the whole letter filled with a particular and melancholy account of our misfortunes. I met with my name a hundred times. I never saw it without fear. Some heavy calamity always followed it. I saw yours, too, equally unhappy. Though length of time ought to have closed up my wounds, yet the seeing of them described by your hand was sufficient to make them all open and bleed afresh. Nothing can ever blot from my memory what you have suffered in defense of your writings. So let me be, have a faithful account of all that concerns you. I would know everything, be it ever so unfortunate. Perhaps by mingling my sighs with yours, I may make your sufferings less. For it is said that all sorrows divided are made lighter. Write to me then immediately, and wait not for miracles, for they are too scarce, and we too much accustomed to misfortunes to expect a happy turn. I shall always have this, if you please, and this will always be agreeable to me, that when I receive any letter from you, I shall know you still remember me. Oh, think of me. Do not forget me. Remember my love and fidelity and constancy. Love me as your mistress. Cherish me as your child, your sister, your wife. Remember, I still love you, and yet strive to avoid loving you. What a terrible saying is this. I shake with horror, and my heart revolts against what I say. I shall blot all my paper with tears. I end my long letter wishing you, if you desire it, forever adieu. We're going to look next at another woman, a contemporary of Eloise. Some of you may have heard of Hildegard of Bingen. Yes. She became very popular in the 80s because she was such a, an extraordinary woman. She was a mystic, and she was, she was an abbess also. Uh, she, was interested, uh, she was interested in music. She was a composer. She was uh, extraordinarily insightful into holistic healing, which is one of the reasons why the 80s uh, found this woman to be so intriguing. 
she also was very well known for the visions that she had from the time that she was a child. And her parents brought her to one of the convents because they felt that she had already become a person of God. And so they thought this would be the best place for her. She was very humble, despite all of the wonderful gifts and talents she had. But the visions kept coming, and people began to really trust in them. And quite unlike any woman of the time, Hildegard was sought out for her counsel by both nobles and important people of every strata, and in some cases, even kings and the Pope. Very, very unlike any other woman of that, of that period. We have some music that Hildegard composed that we'll have you listen to a little bit later. But her interest in such wide-ranging topics and her influence during that period made her still a very intriguing person. Please welcome Hildegard of Venue. <laughs> I believe a human being is a vessel that God has built for himself and filled with his inspiration so that his works are perfected in it. Just as a mirror which reflects all things is set in its own container, so too the rational soul is placed in a fragile container of the body. In this way, the body is governed in its earthly life by the soul, and the soul contemplates heavenly things through faith. Like hairs on the head, mortal man is joined to Jesus Christ, the head of all. But they are full of transgressions and sins because of man's delight in the flesh. But the church regenerates and purifies these from the unclean stench and filth of sin by penitence and confession just as hair is cleansed from dew and drops, and as dust is shaken out and cleansed from wool. The marbles of God are not brought forth from oneself. Rather, it is more like a chord, a sound that is played. The tone does not come out of the chord itself, but rather through the touch of the musician. I am, of course, the lyre and harp, of God's kindness. For when God great, gave great knowledge to the human being, the human being elevated himself in his soul and turned away from God. God so regarded the human being that he would perfect all his works in him. But the old deceiver tricked human beings and infected them with the crime of disobedience. By the delight of the unseasonable wind, so that they sought more than they should ever have. Love abounds in all things. It excels from the depths to beyond the stars, is lovingly disposed to all things. She has given the King on high the kiss of peace. Praise be to God. Well, there you have two nuns. <laughs> and of course, the next one had to be Veronica Franco, one of the most amazing and, and influential courtesans in Venice. She was born around 1546. And in order to understand the power and the influence that Veronica had, you have to understand what Venice was like at the time. It was spectacular. Venice, the city-state, was in its high, high uh, period of productivity and influence. From about the 13th century through the end of the 17th century, Venice was a city that everyone longed to visit, and most did if you were uh, in that part of the world. There were two classes of courtesans at this period the intellectual courtesan, 
and the playtime parties in. <laughs> However, it was clear that Veronica was of a very bright intellect. She wished for a fine marriage, but she was not able to uh, have that because she did not have uh, noble bearings. And so she was taught the trade by her mother, who had also been a courtesan. Veronica had many talents, not the least of which was writing. She loved to write poetry, and she was highly regarded in the circles of literati in Venice at the time. She also was remarkable in her wish to make it possible for women without husbands and other courtesans and their children to have some kind of safe haven. And so she lobbied for a home to be built for women who had been of service but who had no male protectors. Now it's interesting to note that during this time, if you were well-bred and well-met, well-wed, you would have, as a woman, a life of not much opportunity. They were protected and they were kept aside. But the courtesans were free to be a part of all kinds of wonderful thinking circles nobles and even princes. She was the consort of kings as well as the nobility of Venice. It was about 15, let's see here, about 1577 when the plague was rampant in Venice and many, many people died. When she came back, she was also accused of being a witch. The nobility saying, especially the women, that the only reason that their husbands could possibly have gone to her bed was because she had enchanted them. <laughs> but because there were so many of the nobility who had been in her bed, that charge was never able to be proven. It will be a great, a great opportunity for you to meet Veronica Franco. <laughs> I was denied the possibility of marrying well, so I learned the art of the courtesan from my mother. I always had to provide for myself, and I believe that women are as intelligent and as strong as men. I encourage women to find their best talents and to use them for the common good. <laughs> I loved poetry, and I wrote volumes of it for the court to see. We danced our youth and dreamed in, of a city, Venice, paradise, proud and pretty. We lived for love and lust and beauty, pleasure then our only duty, floating them twixt heaven and earth and drank on plenty's blessed mirth. We thought ourselves eternal then, our glory sealed by God's own pen. But paradise, we found, is always frail. Against man's fears will always fail. I was accused of witchcraft, so I defended my life in this way. I confess that as a young girl, I loved a man who would not marry me for want of a dowry. I confess, I had a mother who taught me a different way of life, one I resisted at first, but learned to embrace. I confess, I became a courtesan, traded yearning for power, welcomed many rather than being owned by one. I confess I embraced a whore's freedom over a wife's obedience. I confess I find more ecstasy in passion than in prayer. Such passion is prayer. 
I confess I pray still to feel the touch of my lover's lips, his hands upon me, his arms enfolding me. Such surrender has been mine. I confess I pray still to be filled and inflamed, to melt into the dream of us beyond this troubled place to where we are not even ourselves, to know that always this is mine. If this had not been mine, if I had lived any other way, a child to her husband's will, my soul hardened from lack of touch and lack of love, I confess such endless days and nights would be a punishment far greater than you could meet out. You, all of you, you who hunger for what I cannot bear to see, that kind of power in a woman. You call God's greatest gift ourselves, our yearning, our need to love. You call it filth and sin and heresy. I repent there was no other way open to me, but I do not repent my life. when she was two, uh, beheaded, that was Anne Boleyn. Uh, it was a treacherous time in England. And when we think about her, we think about it being the golden age and what she did to bring all of that about. Took extraordinary courage and bravery of every possible sort. And yet, she was also a great patron of the arts, as you know, as her father had done. These writings are particularly poignant because we see behind the face, behind the queen who gave her country something to rally around in the most extraordinary ways. One of the things that we uncovered when we were studying about Elizabeth was an extraordinary speech that she delivered to Parliament close to the end of her reign, which was almost 45 years. She was uh, at the end of, of her power and knew that, that her time was going to be coming to a close. And she took it, and she delivered to her to her parliament uh, a speech that they had anticipated was going to be about current events. <coughs> Instead, it was a validatory. Let's listen to her now. Please welcome the Queen. <laughs> <laughs> My speaker, I assure you there is no prince who loves his subjects better. There is no jewel, be it never so rich a price, which I set before your love. For I do esteem it more than any treasure or riches. And though God hath raised me high, yet this I count the glory of my crown, that I have reigned for your loves. I do not so much rejoice that God hath made me to be a queen, as to be a queen over so thankful a people. Of myself I must say this, I never was any greedy, scrapping grasper, nor a straight, fast holding prince, nor yet a waster. My heart was never set on any worldly goods. For what you bestow on me, I will not hoard it up, but receive it to bestow on you again. There will never be a queen sit in my seat with more zeal to my country, care to my subjects, and that will sooner with willingness venture her life for your good and safety than myself. For it is my desire to live and reign no longer than my life, 
my reign shall be for your good only. And though you have had and may have many princes more mighty and wise sitting in this seat, yet you never shall have any that will be more careful nor more loving. We're going to take a big change now in direction. Uh, are you able to see these, by the way? We'll send them around. <laughs> We're going to come to the uh, to the Americas now, and. This is probably one of the most interesting of all the women, though I'm not sure if any of you may have heard her name. This is Martha Ballard. She was a midwife in the 1700s in Maine. And after having nine children, she became a midwife. <laughs> uh, that in itself would be enough to bring her out today. <laughs> but she did so much more than that. She was unstoppable. I want you to think about, I'm going to read some of this because this I, I couldn't remember all of it. It's just so exciting. Listen to this. Martha Ballard worked to try to bring as much healing as she could to the people in her region. But she was tireless. In some writings in her diary between August 3rd and the 24th, 1787, she said she performed four deliveries, answered one obstetrical false alarm, made 16 medical calls, prepared three bodies for burial, dispensed pills, did you know they had pills? Pills to, to one neighbor, harvested and prepared the herbs that she would use for healing, and doctored her own husband's sore throat. <laughs> In 21st century terms, she was simultaneously a midwife, a nurse, a physician, a mortician, a pharmacist, and an attentive wife. If that doesn't make you lose your breath, I don't know what will. <laughs> Martha, are you able to join us? <laughs> Spring was treacherous in Maine. On April 23rd, I wrote in my diary of the year 1789, it's clear and very pleasant. I set out to go to Mr. Boland's. I stepped out of the canoe and sunk in the mire. I came back and changed my clothes. I made another attempt and got there safe and set out for home. I called at Captain Cox's and Mr. Gooden's. I was called in at Mrs. Hussey's and I tarried all night. There was a severe storm before morn. The next day, there was a severe storm of rain. I was called at 1 p.m. hour from Mrs. Hussey's by Ebenezer Hewen. I had to cross the river in a boat. A great sea was a-going. We got safe over and set for Mr. Hewen's. I crossed the stream on the way. Wonderful is the goodness and providence. I then proceeded on my journey. I went beyond Mr. Haynes's, and a large tree was blown up by the roots, before which caused my horse to spring back, and luckily, my life was spared. Great and marvelous are thy sparings, O God. And then I was assisted over a fallen tree by Mr. Haynes. I went on. Soon I came to a stream. The bridge was gone. Mr. Hewen took the reins and waded through and led the horse. Assisted by the same almighty power, I got safe through and arrived unhurt. Mrs. Hewins delivered at 10 p.m. the daughter. Now, it is a month later. It's clear. It's a, a cloudy day this afternoon. I'm at another birthing, Mrs. Dawes. Safely delivered in the sixth hour of this morn, a fine sun which weighed 11 pounds. I tarried with her till 4 p.m., and then I came to Mr. Densmore's and tarried all night. Ah, I was able to go home. The next day, we had chickens for dinner. 
This day is the anniversary of the ordination of the Reverend Isaac Forrester, who took over the church and the flock in this town three years since. And now I look forward to winter. It's October 23rd, and it's snowed. I was summoned to Sally Pierce, because this was going to be an illegitimate birth. I knew what I had to ask. I also knew what Sally would say. She was safe delivered at 1 p.m. of a fine sun. Her illness very severe, but I left her cleverly and returned about sunset. Sally declared that my son Jonathan was the father of her child. Remember, after all, in the 18th century, it's a crime to have sexual relations outside of marriage. So I made sure that Jonathan later married Sally. Yeah. <laughs> she was a minister too. <laughs> We're going to stay on this side of the Atlantic for, for this next uh, wonderful presentation. There are many diaries, it turns out, many journals written by women who traveled west in covered wagons. Some of them are very erudite, others barely scribbles. But all of them share the extraordinary difficulties that were part of their everyday. We are familiar with the Donner Pass and what all of that horror was like. But any travel into these unknown lands was extraordinarily difficult and fully <coughs> dangerous. The women somehow managed to, to uphold those families as as strong women as they were. We are going to look at uh, several entries of women from about the 1840s to the 1850s. All of them show such remarkable determination. And I wonder if any of us could make that kind of a trip today. Let's listen to what they had to say. <laughs> Our four mule team got mired so bad this morning. <sighs> I'm weary. We have had to make a long march today to get to water, and we find grass very scarce. We camped in Thousand Springs Valley. Today, distance traveled 35 miles. Friday, the 13th. We have been four long months today on this journey. I am sick, and oh, how weak. I am constantly losing instead of gaining. This constant travel hurts me. We crossed the river and struck into the hills. We struck Peavine Springs on the side of a mountain commanding a splendid pleasure to the north. There was an extensive valley containing a large alkali lake, and the blue outlines of the mountains in the dim background gave it an interesting appearance. Near one of the springs was a man from Indiana, exhumed by the Indians for his blankets. He died on the 7th, but was in too putrid a state to be reburied. The willow stems were round his ankles, where they had drawn him out of his grave. Ah, the feed here is fine and the water excellent. We made a long noon halt and commenced climbing hills again. A few miles farther on, we came to another valley and lake. The road led where the lake had recently been, but the water receded and left the ground hard and smooth and white, and it had the resemblance to ice when the sun shone upon it. Distance traveled 16 miles. June 18th, we heard today that a murdered man had been found in a deep hollow a short distance from the road. The men who, fa who found him had seen him before and knew him. They think he was murdered for his money, as he was known to have a considerable amount, and it is thought that his murderers are in the company with which he was traveling. 
He had a wife and one child. Great must be their sorrow to be thus so cruelly deprived of a dear friend and protector, and left alone in this wild and friendless country. Some men had gone in pursuit of the murderers. Just ahead of us, a wagon ran over a little boy and broke both his legs. Distance traveled 20 miles. June 19th, we heard of another murdered man today. In this case, as in yesterday's, the man was murdered by a man in his own company. But the proof in this instance was positive and the murderer was hung to a tree by the indignant emigrants. We passed opposite the ferry of the North Fork of Platte. Numbers of immigrants were waiting there to get over, but we were saved the trouble and expense of ferrying now by having forded the main Platte several days ago. We camped at the Willow Spring where the water is cold and good. Distance traveled 31 miles. It's hard to imagine that some of those women may have gone on that, on that trip and lost everyone but themselves. Husbands gone, children gone. Some went pregnant. It's amazing to think of what kinds of uh, sacrifices that they, they were making. Well, now we're going to go again to another really big switch uh, to another queen, Queen Victoria. And again, everything has been written about Queen Victoria, but her own writing was so revelatory. She was amazing. Uh, we all know of her great love for Elvis. We all know of her great mourning of El Albert. What we didn't know was that despite the fact that she had nine children, she didn't much like children, especially her own. <laughs> and her writings tell about that. <laughs> she, she was amazingly devoted to her husband, but she was happiest when her children weren't around. Uh, and in particular, some of them. <laughs> um, she was, she was the icon of the age, and it was lovely to find in her writings this beautiful, bubbling, effervescent young woman who was so entirely loving of her new husband and the great tragedy of his absence in her life and what it did to her. She was queen for 63 years and seven months, and I was wondering how close our uh, current Queen Elizabeth is getting to that place. She's 60 years plus. And it just might be true. She might just get, get that record away from Queen Victoria. Interestingly enough, she would tell, she, there are uh, some writings in which she tells some of her daughters to delay having children because once you are married, you are the handmaiden to your husband, and once you have children, it's even worse. So she was, she was remarkably, it seemed, very modern, but she did not, did not at all believe in women's equal rights. So she was a very contradictory person, and it was wonderful to have that chance to see that through her writings. I think I hear her approaching. <laughs> Well, I am most often quoted as saying, we are not amused. I left much documentation on my perceptions of the world. Beginning with my 18th birthday in May, 1837. Ah, today is my 18th birthday. How old! And yet how far I am from being what I should be. I shall from this day take the firm resolution to study with renewed assiduity to keep my attentions always well fixed on whatever I am about, and to strive to become every day less trifling and more fit for what, if heaven wills it, I'm someday to be. 
The courtyard and the streets were crammed when we went to the ball. And the anxiety of the people to see poor, stupid me was very great. And I must say, I am quite touched by it. And I feel proud, and of which I have always done, of my country and of the English nation as a whole. And then in June 1837, in reference to the coronation, I wrote this. I look forward to the event which it seems likely to occur soon. I'm calm, I feel quiet, I am not alarmed at all by it. And yet, I do not suppose myself equal to it. I trust, however, that with good will, honesty, and courage, I shall not at all events fail. In 1854, in June, I wrote about the opening of the Crystal Palace. The tremendous cheering, the joy expressed in every face, the vastness of the building with all its decorations and exhibits, the sounds of the organ, and my beloved husband, the creator of this great peace festival, uniting the industry and the art of all nations of the earth. It was quite overwhelming. Uh, and then in December of 1861, I wrote about the death of my dear Prince Albert. <sighs> Never can I forget how beautiful my darling looked, lying there with his face lit up by the rising sun, his eyes unusually bright, gazing as it were on unseen objects and not taking notice of me. I stood up, I kissed his dear heavenly forehead, and I called out in a bitter, agonizing cry, Oh, my dear darling! And then I dropped on my knees in mute, distracted despair, unable to shed a word or even a tear. In March of 1870, I wrote in reference to the women's right movement. I am most anxious to enlist everyone who can speak or write in joining me in this mad, wicked folly of women's rights, with all its attendant horrors on which her poor, feeble sex is bent, forgetting every sense of womanly feelings and propriety. Feminists ought to get a good whipping. Were women to unsex themselves by claiming equality with men, they would become the most hateful even and disgusting of beings, and would surely perish without male protection. And then, in 1877, when Russia declared war against Turkey, I wrote, Oh, if the queen were a man, she would like to go and give those horrid Russians such a beating. <laughs> who had written about the Civil War, a woman who had written about the Civil War, but this time on the Confederate side. And this is Mary Boykin Chestnut. She was well born, well studied, and was highly placed in society. And she was a very conflicting person. She desperately loved her style of living in the South. She loved the graciousness and all that that meant. But she never was comfortable with slavery. And she knew that the life that she had come to love was going to obviously change dramatically. And so she writes in her diaries of everything that she is observing prior to the war and throughout it. There, extremely interesting reading and I recommend it to you because it's a, a wonderful view of the other side and what that whole level of society was experiencing. Her diaries are very, very illuminating and so will she be. Do I hear? <laughs> Do I hear? Mary? Yes, I do. There you are, Mary. <laughs> In my diary, 
1861, on June 27th, I wrote, In Mrs. Davis's drawing room last night, the president took a seat by me on the sofa where I sat. He talked for nearly an hour. He laughed at our faith in our own powers. We are like the British. We think every Southerner equal to three Yankees at least. We will have to be equivalent to at least a dozen now. After his experience of fighting qualities of Southerners in Mexico, he believes that we will do all that we can be done by pluck and muscle and endurance and dogged courage, dash and red hot patriotism. And yet his tone was not sanguine. There was a sad refrain running through it all. For one thing, either way, he thinks it will be a long war. That floored me at once. It has been too long for me already. Then, he said, before the end came, we would have many a bitter experience. He said only fools doubted the courage of the Yankees or their willingness to fight when they saw fit. And now we have stung their pride. We have roused them till they fight like devils. And now it is July, 1861. Yesterday, as we left the cars, we had a glimpse of war. It was the saddest sight. The memory of it is hard to shake off. Six soldiers, not wounded ones, there were quite 200, they said, lying about as best they might on the platform. Their pale, ghastly faces. So here's one of the horrors of war we have not reckoned on. There were so many good men and good women rendering all the service possible in the circumstances. And now it is August, 1861. Women who, become, who come before the public are in a bad box now. False hair is taken off and searched for papers. Bustles are suspect. All manners of things, they say, come over the border under huge ho hoops now worn. So they are ruthlessly torn off. Not legs, but arms are looked for under the hoops and, sad to say, found. Then women are used as detectives and searchers to see that no men slip over wearing petticoats. So the poor creatures coming this way are humiliated to the deepest degree. To men, glory, honor, praise, and power if they are patriots. To women, daughters of Eve, punishment comes still in some shape. Do what they will. And later that month I wrote, I hate slavery. I hate a man who, you say there are no more fallen women on a plantation than in London in proportion to numbers, but what do you say to this, to a magnate who runs a hideous black harem with its consequences under the same roof with his lovely white wife and his beautiful and accomplished daughters? Oh, he holds his head high and poses as the model of all human virtues to these poor women whom God and the laws have given him. From the height of his awful majesty, he scolds and thunders at them as if he never did wrong in his life. Fancy such a man finding his daughter reading Don Juan. <laughs> you with that immortal book, he would say, and then he would order her out of his sight. You see, Mrs. Stowe did not hit the sorest spot. She makes Legree a bachelor. And then, in the summer of 1865, I wrote, we went to our plantation, the Hermitage, yesterday. Saw no change. Not a soul was absent from his or her post. And I said, good colored folks, are you going to kick off the traces and be free? In their furious, emotional way, they swore devotion to us all their dying day. Just the same, the minute they see an opening to better themselves, they will move on.
going to take another twist. Uh, this is New York City in the 20s and 30s. And we came around a sort of a back yard entrance to get to find this woman. Her name is Florence Wolfson. In 2003, on the Upper West Side, in a very affluent neighborhood, a great old trunk was put out on the, on the sidewalk. And somehow or other, it was too curious not to look into it. And when the, the folks who were rummaging through that great old chest found a diary, they thought this had promise. And a young New York Times reporter was given the diary, thinking it would be kind of fun to, to imagine who the woman was. She opened the diary, and out fell a small clipping of her uh, high school graduation. And she thought, is it possible, could it be possible that this woman might still be alive and maybe not even know that this diary is still available, that she might want to read about her previous wonderful teenage life. What's interesting about Florence is that she lived a very luxurious life during some of the most exciting time in New York. She was, her family was well uh, connected. She loved the arts. She was very bright and very precocious. She was given this diary when she was 14. But she doesn't sound 14. I think she was going on 35. <coughs> what was wonderful was that Lily Koppel, the New York Times reporter, was able to find her at 90 years old, living in Florida. And when she brought the diary to her, <coughs> Florence told her much, much more than what the diary had contained. And it was an extraordinary meeting. It resulted in a book that's called The Red Leather Diary. And it's really a wonderful read. Florence, would you come and tell us about it? <laughs> At 90, I was living what can only be called a bland life. Mobility was low. No golf. No <laughs> tents. No long walks. But curiosity about people and politics was high. And there were such activities as practicing the scales on the piano, playing bridge, reading, and agonizing with friends over America's current quagmire. Everything was going to be the same until the final downhill slide. What was there to expect? What indeed? I was sitting on my patio in Florida one glorious April afternoon when the phone rang. An unknown voice greeted me when I answered. Hello, my name is Lily Cobble. Are you by any chance Florence Wolfson? I wondered if this was going to be some marketing nuisance. <laughs> I was a little curious, so I owned up to being me. Lily said, I have some old things belonging to you that I picked up at 98 Riverside Drive, and I thought you might want them back. What things? I asked. Oh, an old red leather diary, some short stories you wrote when you were 15, and your master's thesis from Columbia. I'll be happy to send them to you. Those words changed my life. I told her not to bother to send them because my daughters would pick them up on a trip to New York. So, waiting to hear from Valerie or Karen, she didn't send them. She read the diary. I totally forgot about it. I couldn't imagine anyone finding it of any interest. But in the meantime, Lily did a piece for the New York Times based on this 76-year-old relic. When I came back to Westport for the summer, she handed me the diary. Oh, what a moment. How do you feel when a forgotten chunk of your life, full of adolescent angst and passion, is handed to you? How do 
do you feel when you see your striving, feeling, immature self through your now elderly eyes? It stopped my heart for a moment. I was stunned and a little sad. I read the diary avidly, and I came to love that young girl. Lily's article turned out to be a mesmerizing piece of journalism, provoking enough interest to be developed into a book. When I heard the news, it was as though I had been hit by lightning. From being hidden in a diary with a key, 14-year-old Florence was going to be revealed to the world. I'm now 92. My husband of 67 years died last April. And I'm fighting to keep my fingers in the pie of life. Young Florence would have agreed that this is a positive. She would have said, go for it. <laughs> it has been fun. It has added zest to my life. It has brought back some of the passion of my youth. It has made me feel more alive than I have in years. I am probably one of the most excited old women in the world. Thank you, Lily Cobble. <laughs> organization called Mass Observation, individuals who just had normal lives, as much as you could in the pre-war and war period, to write in a diary what their life was like during these very dramatic and life-changing times. One of them, one of the people who chose to do that was Olivia Crockett. She wrote in her diary from 1939 to 1942. And while we have heard so much about what wartime Britain was like, this diary is really a treasure trove of insights into the everyday, the difficulties that were part of their life, the fears, and yet the indomitable human desire to survive. Her writing is both poignant insightful, and always, always a marvel. Let's welcome Olivia. <laughs> In the summer of 1939, London was changing daily. War anxieties were thawing in mists, and civilian preparations were in full force. We were ordered to black out our windows at night. Many families prepared air raid shelters and made arrangements for children to be sent to safer locations. I felt weepy at seeing groups of children with their bundles being evacuated to the provinces. But there was a marked rise in kindness in the atmosphere. Small jokes and pleases and thank yous and mistakes quickly explained away, apologies more easily tendered and accepted. But I do believe the news we are getting nowadays is cooked by the authorities in their erroneous recipe as to what will best preserve the morale of the public. News had always been a mixture of facts and opinions served up with a journalese spice of soft, saucy language. Well, as the war progressed, faces lengthened, tempers shortened. A radio appeared in the office, and now the one o'clock news is a daily feature I cannot escape. They remarked that all this news might lead to nervous breakdown types, and it made me think. Now I read and listen and ponder, but talk as little as possible and try not to pass on the horrors. 
We did have some excitement last night. I was in bed reading about 10 p.m. I heard a heavy, low plane. It sounded unnatural. I listened. It got terribly close. And then, <clears throat> machine gun, slippers and coat, and I rushed down to the baby <coughs> nephew. I stood with his mother near him, and we heard three or four more bursts receding. Dad came up and said it was only the exhaust. We pretended to believe him and went to bed. There are strong feelings about everything, that it might be the last of its kind, so we have to enjoy it. We were grateful for the moon, grateful for the sunny morning, grateful for a seat on the train, grateful for a comfortable body, grateful for being able to shut our eyes at night and occasionally shut off our minds to the present difficulties. The bombings are getting closer. Plane right overhead, more bangs. I ran up to get my coat, it was so cold down below. There's no word I can start off with to give the mood of these ghastly days and nights of bombing in London. The blitz has, te has tears away from good life. It makes good all more important. I've not lost my, my nerve yet. When I was asked what changes did I personally hope to be brought about by this war to end all wars, I answered, I hope our returning men will have their needs met. I hope that widows and orphans will be well treated. I hope old age, unemployment, hospitals, schools, health services will all be adequately dealt with. I hope ostentatious luxuries will be cut out. I hope International Federation will cut the silliest sort of politics away. I hope industry will serve the needs of people instead of using those needs for its own gains. How do I feel about 1941? I feel that I shall be damned glad if I'm lucky to see it all. And I'd rather like to see it. Olivia also wrote, and I thought this was really quite uh, telling, words, words, glorious words. I play around them with like strings, throwing them like dice across the board of my mind. Some seem new minted like old gold coins reissued. Bless their creation. She was a very effective writer, wasn't she? <laughs> okay. And now we come to our last woman that we're considering tonight. Her name is Ree Drummond. Do any of you know her? She, we called this program From Quill to Blog, thinking about the many ways that women recorded their, their writing. She is a very well-known blogger. But she didn't start out that way. Ree was born in Oklahoma, went to UCLA, was planning to become a lawyer, came home between her last class at UCLA and was going to be going off to Chicago to study law when she fell in love with a wonderful cowboy back in Oklahoma. And so she left her high heels for tractor wheels, is what she said, and went on to become a farmer's wife, uh, a rancher's wife, actually, homeschooling her children, learning everything there was to know about homesteading in this time. And she thought what fun it would be to share some of that on the internet. Doesn't everybody want to share everything on the internet? <laughs> And she was very clever. She wrote well. After all, she was going to be a lawyer. She also had a great knack for cooking and baking. And she began to add to her blog things like recipes, pictures of her garden. And one thing led to another. And she has 13 million readers. She is so interesting <laughs> to many people that it's there's a movie being planned uh, to be made of her life. She has books now. She still blogs. 
and she's quite a character. Please welcome Bree Drummond. I'm not a public speaker. In fact, I'm just the opposite. I am a blogger. So my heart is racing right now, wondering if I can get through this presentation without a heart attack. No one is more surprised than I am that my words online have become so popular, and I thank all of you for your continuing interest. My adult story begins when, when after several years in L.A., I returned to my hometown of Bartlesville, Oklahoma. I went there to prepare for my transition to law school, and during that time I met some friends at a local bar, and I saw a cowboy across the room. He was dressed in Wranglers, and he would change my life forever. The connection was intense and immediate. All thoughts of law school were left in town when we married. He took me to his large farm to begin my life as a cowgirl. And after four children, all homeschooled, and years of enjoying good cooking, I decided to begin a blog. In my kitchen, happily comfortable in my yoga pants, I started my blog, and I called it A Pioneer Woman. Moving from a big city to a ranch on the prairie brought me endless inspiration. Life is quieter, relaxed, and friendly. And though I am an accidental cowgirl, I love this life, and I enjoy sharing my insights. I expected only my family would read it, but somehow it has become enormously popular. Now, I love sharing family recipes and easy cooking techniques. I know my recipes are easy to manage because my growing girls can now make a number of our favorite dishes. Surely you can, too. I include sections on homeschooling, gardening, photography, and life, revealing that we all face and juggle the same things in our life wherever we live. And your responses enrich my life every day. When my first book, Pioneer Woman Cooks, came out in 2009, it too met with a warm reception. In the book, I indicate recipes that are certain to be cowboy friendly. Everything in life is better when you have good meals in your cooking arsenal. I believe that these are proposal-worthy recipes, or renewed passion meals you should not miss. I've been on The View, the Bonnie Hunt Show. I've been interviewed by the New York Times and the LA Times and even Business Week. I didn't mind that the New York Times book review said, vegetarians and gourmands won't find much in here, but it's a real portrait of an American family kitchen and it works. And that was fair. And I appreciated it. The Chronicle of Our Romance, my Marlboro Man and My Romance, will be was published as a book on Valentine's Day last year. And to my even greater surprise, the rights to this story have been sold to Columbia Pictures. And it's rumored that Reese Witherspoon is going to play me. <laughs> Who would have guessed that life on the prairie would be so interesting to so many? Certainly, our love story is not on the lofty plane as Eloise and Edward. But I thank all of you for your interest. And I hope I can continue to share the richness of my prairie life for many years. May the quiet and the calm of the prairie rest in your hearts, too. Good night. <laughs> from which that wonderful dialogue came, monologue, I guess I should say. Uh, we have a, a reading list if you uh, would like to take them. But I think we should all thank Liz, who is a woman for all singing. <laughs> and a lot of fun and educational and all that good stuff. Okay. 
Great. One more round of applause. Come on, guys.